Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to the LSE for tonight's event. My name is Craig Calhoun. I'm privileged to be the director of the LSE and to be able to welcome you on the school's behalf to hear Professor Lord Nicholas Stern. It's customary on these sorts of occasions that I welcome our guest to the LSE, but on this occasion I can hardly welcome Nick Stern to the LSE. He has a long and distinguished history of connection to the school that begins before he was born when his mother attended the LSE. <laughs> I'm sure that you're all aware of many of the important distinctions that Nick Stern has brought to the school by being associated with us. He comes to the LSE from a distinguished academic career and also from important public service, having been the chief economist of the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development and of the World Bank. This distinguished public service has caused a series of LSE directors have had to have had to hire Nick back. I am the first LSE director in years who has not had yet to hire Nick back. <laughs> and I hope to keep him here and avoid that need. Professor Stern is the first holder of the IG Patel Chair of Economics and Government, named after one of my distinguished predecessors as the head of the LSE. He is the director of the India Observatory, chairman of the Asia Research Center, and chairman of the Grantham Research Institute on Climate Change and the Environment. When Nick was the head of the UK Government Economic Service, he led a review on the economics of climate change, which was published in October 2006, and is one of the landmarks in the world's coming to grips with climate change, but also with the need for sensible economic programs to deal with the issues of climate change. Today, Lord Stern will be presenting a lecture based on his new book, Why We Are Waiting, The Logic, Urgency, and Promise of Tackling Climate Change. For those Twitter users in the audience, and I hope there are many, the hashtag for today's event is hash LSE Stern. I would like to ask you to put your phones on silent so as not to disrupt the event which is being recorded and will hopefully be made available as a podcast and a video subject to avoiding your phone ringing or other technical difficulties. As usual, after the lecture, there will be a chance for you to put your questions to Lord Stern, and there will be a book signing at the end. But for now, please simply join me in welcoming Professor Lord Nicholas Stern to deliver his lecture, Why We Are Waiting. Nick. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Craig. Um, and thank you all very much for coming. It, it's actually, I see so many friends here. I, I wonder if there's anybody else. But um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you all very much. Um, this uh, is my book from the Lionel Robbins Lectures um, of um, February 2012. It sometimes takes a little time to write things up, but I got involved in um, thinking some more, and a lot of the stuff that I'm going to talk, you, talk to you about today was only really embryonic in the Lionel Robbins Lectures, but they came from the Lionel Robbins Lectures, and I want to thank the Robbins family um, very much, and uh, Richard Layard, who's here as the chair of the Lionel Robbins Lecture Committee, for asking me to do that. Um, you'll be relieved to know that whereas the Stern Review was 700 pages, this book is only 400. It, it's a long book, uh, even if it's only 400, so I'm going to move fairly rapidly. But this is the LSE, and you're intelligent, and if you're not from the LSE, you're self-selected to come here, so I'm going, to move, I'm going to move fast. I want to thank particularly those who um, helped me and helped me a lot with this book. Um, James Ridge, Rodney Boyd, Fergus Green, Kerry Quirk, Eva Lee. It would not have happened um, without their involvement. 
I also want to thank um, the members of the Stern Review from which all this grew. I can see at least two of them here. I don't know uh, how many more there are, but uh, they were uh, at the core of all this, and it was a special year, a hard year, but a special year. And I want to thank the um, Grantham Institute and the ESRC for support for, for this work. So as always, there are a lot of people involved to thank in this. Um, those of you who remember um, Gordon Brown will... Um, <laughs> oh, Oh, there we are. Well, that's the end. <laughs> that is the end. I should have done this before I began, no? Does anybody help me go through it? I can get to the end, but not to the beginning. Yeah. Anyway, it's in the theatre it's called Vamping Until Ready. Is it supposed to be moving? <laughs> Not moving. That one, that one. Okay. Good. Anyway, <laughs> those of you who remember, <laughs> you get a real appreciation for not very much. Um, <laughs> though, those who remember Gordon Brown will remember that all time series started in 1997 and uh, proceeded inexorably uh, upwards until certain things started to happen. But um, I'm going to follow that spirit and um, date time since the beginning of work on the Stern Review, and that is 10 years ago. We assembled 10 years ago, the summer of um, 2005. So what's happened since then? Well, the um, science is more risky. Uh, the Emissions have gone up faster than we thought. Some of the effects are coming through, uh, like the melting of the Arctic ice, more quickly than we thought. Some of the things left out of the models, like, uh, like most of the scientific models, the thawing of the permafrost uh, and the release of the methane, look more worrying than it did. The science and the risks look more worrying. On the other hand, uh, we did not anticipate how fast technology would move. Um, the for example, I mean, I'll be coming back to this, but the collapse in the price of um, solar PV, probably by a factor of 10 in those uh, 10 years, of the price of a panel, is, is quite remarkable. And all kinds of technological developments um, uh, across uh, a whole area of activity that's highly relevant for this. Um, something that's come through much more strongly in the last three years, and I'll come back to it three or four years, is the understanding of the deep costs of air pollution. Uh, they are quite extraordinary. More than a million people killed a year in uh, China. Many more, I think, than a million a year killed in India. The Supreme Court accepted uh, just uh, about a month ago an estimate of 29,000 people a year killed from air pollution in the UK. 29,000, 1,700 killed in road accidents. If road accidents went up by a factor of three to 5,000, it would still be 5,000 compared to 29,000, but if that happened, there would be very strong measures taken very quickly. The understanding of that has come with the observation, uh, measurement locally and observation from satellites on the extent of air pollution and um, a lot of work from the um, uh, WHO and other medics on just what the costs are of that epidemiological and uh, otherwise. Political will, it depends where you look. Um, the, uh, you have to be very careful in the LSE, which is such an uh, international audience, not to use pe 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 peculiar um, ways of describing things like the curate's egg. But you remember the curate's egg is uh, good in parts, and the political will has stuttered 
in quite a few places over these last few years, partly as a result of the recession, but it's moved um, very quickly in other parts, particularly China, which I'll come back to. And of course, quantitatively, that is of enormous importance. And we are seeing fundamental change. Also, quite strongly in influencing my own thinking, is the situation of the challenge of changing our infrastructure in cities and in energy, particularly and protecting our forests at the time when the world is going through a process of fundamental structural change with very fast urbanization, very rapid movement of the uh, division of labor towards the developing world. When I started teaching uh, economics about a um, very long time ago, <laughs> uh, around 1970, um, we used to talk about 75-80% uh, of the output coming from the rich world. Uh, it's now 50-50, it depends how you measure it, but it's about 50-50 now and 20, 25 years from now it'll probably be a third coming from the rich world. You know, that's in one uh, professional lifetime. That is a quite extraordinary change. And of course, I'll, co I'll come back to that, but I now see all this much more in terms of the opportunities we now have in making these investments in the low carbon economy in a world that's changing very rapidly. And that really does change the way in which you understand these things. So this is the structure of what I'm gonna say. Those of you who believe me to be an economist, which includes myself, um, will see that actually we've got science, ethics, psychology, politics. That's the nature of the subject. That's how it comes to you. So you'd better be ready to grapple with them and you'd better have friends who can uh, guide you on those things. I've had wonderful science, uh, teachers, um, and uh, similarly I've spoken to the world's leading psychologists and moral philosophers and, and so on, and I've had a great help from my friends. So let's start with the science. It's going to, I'm going to go through this very fast because you probably know it, but it's very important in setting the whole policy context and the way in which we cast this problem. So we emit more greenhouse gases than the Earth and its atmosphere can absorb. Uh, those then result in an increase in the concentrations of greenhouse gases. It's a ratchet effect because CO2 lasts uh, such a long time. That increase in concentrations uh, prevents the uh, escape. This is the greenhouse effect. Expense, it prevents the escape of infrared energy because the greenhouse gas molecules, that's what defines a greenhouse gas. The greenhouse gas molecules uh, uh, oscillate at a similar uh, frequency, so you get that interference. So the more the concentrations, the less infrared energy escapes. You get uh, increased temperatures and climate change. And climate change um, has very profound effects on humans, mostly through water in some shape or form, uh, or its absence, floods and droughts and storms and sea level rise and so on, and also some direct effects of uh, temperature, extreme events being very important in this story. So that's how it works. Everything there is subject to uncertainty. I won't go through the details of all the different parameters, but the whole story is subject to uncertainty. So this has to be a problem of the management of risk. We have to see it. It's not a narrow cost-benefit analysis where we disturb this little bit and then say, oh, that's a bit costly. Well, how much does it how we have to pay to prevent it and just compare the two. That kind of thing will be in there somewhere and be of importance, but it cannot be the whole story. This is about the management of risk on an immense scale. So the science has given us just about as difficult a problem as we could possibly have. The scale is immense. Uh, as you'll see in a moment, the, we're already at now at the edge of temperatures of the Holocene, the period since the last ice age, which essentially saw the domestication of grasses, us, us settling down uh, to look after the, the grain. So you have villages and you have a surplus and you have storage and you've got uh, the uh, surplus for, um, to have universities and all those kinds of things that a surplus gives you. Our whole society comes in the last few thousand years and uh, we've been plus or minus one degree centigrade. We're already on the edge of that now. Two degrees is a lot more than we are now. We're up 0.8 or so degrees uh, global average surface temperature relative to the uh, 19th century, end of the 19th century, which is the usual benchmark. Uh, three degrees we, wouldn't, we won't have seen for three million years, four degrees for tens of millions 
of years. That's a measure, remember, we're around as Homo sapiens, perhaps 250,000 years. This is quite extraordinary. It's right outside the scale of what we're used to. Lots of risk and uncertainty. Long lags in the system before these often decades, before some of these effects come through. And it's the sum total. The atmosphere doesn't count where uh, whether um, a, a kilogram of greenhouse gases came from um, Johannesburg or London or Beijing or, or Los Angeles. It's the sum total that counts. So those four effects are direct features of the science. The science couldn't have made it more difficult for us as people who study the economics of policy. Or just one of those things would have been hard. And we've got all four. And um, that's a key part of what we have to hold that in our minds as we think about this story. So it's about immense risk, it's about uh, the long run story as well as the short run and that is going to bring ethics very powerfully to the centre stage of any serious analysis. So how fast is it going up? Well we're adding about two and a half parts per million a year. Um, not so long ago we were adding just half a part per million a year and that two and a half per million parts per million a year that we're adding to the concentrations, that itself is rising. 100 years of that could be adding another 300 if we don't change our ways. We're already at 445 parts per million, just uh, CO2 equivalent, looking at the, the Kyoto gases, 400 CO2 on its uh, own. Um, so CO2 equivalent, we could be at 750 if we don't do much for a century, and that means we're talking about median temperature increases of at least four and high probabilities above five. Um, temperatures which, you know, it's very hard to think about with any seriousness without thinking about a complete rewriting of where we could live, how we could live and so on. And lots of people moving on a big scale. Um, it would probably be hundreds of millions or a billion. You know, Southern Europe, like the Sahara Desert, much of Bangladesh and Florida and so on, uh, underwater, loss of snows off the big mountains that provide the uh, rivers and water supply, a complete rewriting of uh, where we could be and how we could live. And I don't see how you can think of people moving on that kind of scale without thinking of severe and sustained conflict. And you can't make a peace treaty when you decide it was all a bad idea because uh, it's all locked in and uh, you can't switch it off with any kind of um, rapidity. So the stakes we're playing the stakes for which we are playing are immense. Um, so this, it's very important to start with the science because it essentially defines the problem for us and what we face. So what about public policy? Well, I've already um, emphasised the uncertainty and the publicness. Well, if you have something that's rather uncertain and you have the complications of trying to get everybody together in order to take it on, then you might say, well, why don't we wait a bit and see if things clarify? And in some circumstances, that's not a stupid reaction to uncertainty. It's a profoundly stupid reaction to uncertainty in this context because of the dangers of delay. I've already talked about the ratchet effect, which means the flow is built up into the concentrations. It's very difficult to get the greenhouse gases out once uh, they are uh, up there. It's worse than that because if we build infrastructure now, thinking, oh, well, it may not be a problem, we'll carry on as we are, then you lock in high hydrocarbon uh, infrastructure and much of that lasts for decades. So this is a story where, uh, notwithstanding the uh, prevalence of uncertainty, wait and see is profoundly dangerous. I've already argued that this is a process of risk management. How do you analyse, how do you think about very big risks? Now, you can do narrow models and they do help. Models which look at the growth of the economy, you make guesses about consequences of emissions of greenhouse gases, you say how can we adjust those a bit and uh, what does it cost to reduce the emissions of greenhouse gases and you look at the costs of adjusting downwards the emissions, you look at the benefit of um, uh, getting those lower emissions in terms of the uh, reduced damages and you try and balance those things out. Now that's not um, to be dismissed but as I've described it, it doesn't really get us our hands fully round. It's a contribution to, but it doesn't get our hands fully round the big stories of how do we think about these risks and how can we change ourselves and the dynamics of how we change ourselves because there'll be lots of learning and discovery in all this. 
So you have to think about the big risks and you have to think about the processes of change, not just fiddling with a parameter to try to knock down the uh, emissions for a given unit of GDP or output. So that's how we have to frame the story. Fine to have a little bit of the standard growth modelling within that, but we delude ourselves if we think that is the whole story. Now, here you are. This is this bit uh, for the straight uh, economists. How many of you got economics degree here? Oh, that's pretty good. But it's less than a half, so... Um, anyway, I, I, economics should be comprehensible, so I'll, I'll do my best. The, essentially, um, a lot of economic policy starts with a, an idea of why it is that markets can work well, what the assumptions are in which markets work well, and then it gives you and you run through all the reasons why those assumptions don't hold, and they're usually lots, and there are here, and uh, you say, well, let's see if we can fix it by uh, uh, having a policy here that corrects that market failure, another one here that corrects that market failure. It's quite a good way to proceed. And let's just check what happens. Well, of course, this is the greenhouse emissions of greenhouse gas. It affects the uh, ability, the life to work and consume and the lives and livelihoods of other people, particularly people who uh, come or are going to be living in the future. But we're going to be living in the future, and so too for our children and grandchildren. So it's very important to think about the consequences for others of the emissions of greenhouse gases. They are damaging. Uh, we are allowing people to do something which is very costly for nothing. And that, by anybody's standards, is a distortion of the markets. It means they give the wrong incentives and uh, that is the externality associated with the greenhouse gases. If you were brought up in Chicago and, that, and you thought the world was perfect, and all that exists is efficient, because were it not efficient, it would not exist, you would come to the conclusion that you've just discovered an externality, just fix that one and everything will be all right. Well, it ain't that simple. You do have to fix that one and it's the first on the list greenhouse gases. R&D is a particular important in, in, in this context. An idea is a public good. If you have an idea, even if it's something that doesn't work, if you show it doesn't work, if you have an idea that does work, you show it does work, you're giving benefit to others, which the market, without some kind of intervention, doesn't compensate you for. That's particularly important in this case because we're in a hurry and the risks are so big. It's not just an example of that. It is an example of that but it's, uh, the risks are big, we're in a hurry, and it's important to um, build that into our understanding of the importance of the uh, R&D. But it is uh, also important because the use of the technology that you discover is itself beneficial. So those two reasons why it goes beyond R&D. A lot of this is about long-term investment, and we all know that risk and capital markets don't handle that well. There are all kinds of ways in which we can uh, get it to handle better. Feed-in tariffs, flaws on uh, carbon prices, green investment banks, I was involved in the one we've got here, and so on. Thirdly, uh, sorry, fourthly, the um, networks. An awful lot of what counts here is involves structures, grids, uh, networks in, in the jargon, and the market by itself doesn't make networks work well. You have to have some kind of government uh, coordination which allow it. It doesn't have to be that the, all the actors are public sector actors, that's absolutely not necessary, but you do need a framework within which it can work. You know, you need uh, public transport systems, broadband, electricity grids, and that can't work without some kind of government framework. All sorts of issues around information. This is something that's uh, new and developing. And finally, <coughs> what's called rather sort of limply uh, co-benefits, but is of immense importance. I've already mentioned the air pollution story, and that is immense. Um, I can't, won't go into the details, but a, a ton of coal costs, depends on the coal we're talking about, but a ton of coal costs around $50, even a very modest carbon price. $25 a tonne CO2, which is far too low. Uh, even that would double it up because coal, you multiply by 1.9 to, to get from the burning of the coal to the uh, 
CO2, that take you to around $100, and my own view is at least another $100 for the air pollution. If anybody says to you that coal is cheap, don't let them finish the sentence. Uh, it's not $50 a tonne, it's at least $200 a tonne. Then that's a way of translating this idea of the co-benefit into a policy. Biodiversity, of course, enormously important. So there are at least six very important uh, market failures here, all of which we know what to do something about. It's not mysterious, but it is very important, and it's not just a story of a price on carbon, although that's the first on the list. So this is a story of thinking about, and I haven't got a chance to uh, develop it in any detail, maybe come up in questions, but how you design policy to foster learning and change. And actually one of the most formative periods of my professional life was at the EBRD, which was about uh, fostering uh, change, fostering, in that case, the transition to the open market economy. Article 1, right? I can see a few people from the uh, EBRD here. And you had to think about the process of fostering change. There are lots of things that you, know, you, you set off effects which uh, can snowball. You, you, know, you turn the light on somewhere and people uh, better be an LED, not an incandescent, but you, you turn the light on so that people can see and they can learn and you start things off, you start things uh, moving. That whole story of research and innovation, how you get things to change, is, should be at the heart of our research of, on economic policy here. It's a pro fostering a process of dynamic change. It's not just picking up market uh, market failures in a uh, static economy. That's why on Monday uh, a group of us, uh, Richard and myself and others, launched the uh, Apollo program asking for um, uh, another $10 billion a year around the world, which is obviously peanuts, 0.02% um, of world GDP, to um, invest on fostering new technologies, particularly, not exclusively, particularly around solar and storage. And it has had quite a good pickup. Or I had the rather discouraging news, to, news today that it's been supported by Bjorn Lomborg, which is the... Um, <laughs> gave me second thoughts, but uh, uh, only for a moment, because it's fundamentally a good idea, even if some strange people support it. Now, the, the next thing I'd like to do, and this is a very... I've, I've spoken about the big risks, and I've emphasised the stakes that we're playing for. So, what do we do? What can we do? Does it look attractive? as uh, my in Indian friends here, and there are quite a few tonight, what to do? And that is the uh, challenge, that's the story. But actually when we ask what to do, it looks enormously attractive. And let's just look at some of that. But the first thing we have to do in coming to the conclusion that it's enormously attractive, we have to ask ourselves the question, the scale. And all too often people don't understand the scale of the change that we have to make. I won't go through it in detail, but one way of benchmarking the scale of the change, is that the overall emissions for the world, uh, for anything like a two degree path, and it's quite rightly a benchmark, uh, two degrees, um, I've explained a little bit about why at the beginning, um, we would have to be around uh, 20 billion tonnes CO2 equivalent or less in the middle of this century. 20 billion tonnes. There will be nine something billion people in the world around that time. So we will be around two tonnes per capita. We emit 50 billion tonnes CO2 equivalent now, 50, with seven billion of us. So we're emitting around seven tonnes per capita. Uh, on average, we've got to get down to two tonnes per capita in uh, the middle of this century. That's an enormous change. You may remember the United States about 20 tonnes per capita, we in Europe uh, 11, 12, 13 tonnes per capita, China about 10 tonnes ca per capita, India just 2 tonnes per capita CO2 equivalent. So there's an enormous range, but we've got to get down to 2 tonnes per capita as a world average. Well, you know, this isn't Lake, Lake Wobegon where all the children are uh, above average. The average is the average. So if there are few people below two tons per capita, there probably will be few people below, there will have to be few people above two tons per capita. That's a measure of the, the change and the scale of change that we uh, have to make. And it's very important to have that in mind. This illustrates the paths that uh, we could be on, which is sort of the brownie red path, and the path which we need to be on, which is uh, the blue path. The, um, you can always do a bit more 
now and a bit less later or a bit less later, sorry, a bit more now and a bit less later or a bit less now and a bit more later. So that's why we have a corridor there. But what you can't do is think you can bump along the upper part of the corridor. If you're at the upper part of the corridor early on, you better be at the lower part of the corridor down the end because it's the total over time that uh, matters here. So you can see that um, we really need to move pretty quickly if we'll be able to give ourselves any reasonable chance of uh, two degrees. So that's the uh, story. It's a story of quite extraordinary uh, change. We know, for example, that within that story we can burn uh, no more than a half, perhaps no more than a third, of the already proven hydrocarbon reserves. That's why the people argue we have to keep it in the ground, and they're, they're dead right. We do have to keep it in the ground. Uh, that's the scale, another measure of um, what we have to do and the scale and strength of action that we need. So um, another way of putting it, just to underline that still further because it's important, we have to cut world emissions from 50 to 20. We have to divide by around 2.5 over this next 35 years. If world output grew at 3% for that time, then we'd be uh, talking about a factor of uh, around 3 uh, in terms of growth of output. So if absolute is cut by a factor of 2.5, if output's gone up by a factor of 3, then emissions per unit of output have to be cut by a factor of 3 times 2.5, 7 or uh, 8. That is, there are going to be many sectors where it's quite difficult to do that, so there are going to be many sectors, big sectors, where we have to go to zero. And that's uh, the middle part of the century, and on, that, on total, we'd have to go to zero uh, by the uh, um, end of the um, century. So uh, I start with the scale to rub it in, just how strong our action has to be. But then I think you start to get cheerful because this is a new energy industrial revolution, we have to change our ways in a uh, very direct way and now we situate this story, as I said at the beginning, in a world of rapid structural change. So we've got to do that very fast transition to a low carbon economy, but we do that in a world which is um, changing um, very rapidly and that actually gives us an opportunity. Um, the uh, number of people in cities, 50% of 7 billion now, 3.5 billion, will go to 70% of uh, 9 plus billion in the middle of the century, well, uh, 0.7 times uh, 9 would be 6.3 billion, it's a bit above, so we're going to go from 3, and I, I mean, it's only mental arithmetic, you can all do that, the um, 3.5 billion in cities now to 6.5 billion in the middle of this century. That happens only once in the history of the world. And it's an enormous, enormous opportunity. It coincides, as I emphasised earlier, earlier, with a very big move in the centre of gravity of uh, economic activity to the um, developing world. And that's going to be passing, th so they're going to be passing through incomes with a very high income elasticity of demand for energy. In other words, as their incomes move through this uh, range of incomes, the demand for energy is pretty high. So this means that we're going to be making big investments in our cities, big investments in our energy systems, and of course we're going to have to protect our forests and invest in our, in our land as well. So this period of investment, which is going to come anyway, can be done well or can be done badly. And if we do it well, we'll be doing the lion's share of what we would need to do to cut emissions. And that's why this is such an important opportunity and why the story of growth and the story of um, transition to a low-carbon economy come together. This is a very stylistic um, uh, graph, but if you look at waves of technological change, uh, they have all been come, they all go on for a few decades, and they all go on in ways which um, are full of innovation, investment, discovery, and growth. So this is a growth story, but it's a growth story that has to be a growth story based on uh, discovery. You all know your economic history. This is a classification uh, down to the uh, wonderful Chris Freeman, who died a couple of years ago, graduate, of course, of the uh, London School of uh, Economics, and Carlotta Perez, who worked very closely with, uh, with Chris. 
So if we see it that way, in terms of structural transformation, in terms of the economic history of waves of technological change, we become much less pessimistic, and indeed, I think we become optimistic. But of course, and this is a, a major theme of what I'm saying this evening, is that uh, now is the time, because if we let that 20 years run forward, those investments will have been made. And in many ways, and if we do them badly, we're locked in for a long time. It's actually one of the most exciting periods to be alive for policy wonks. And uh, we're all, no, not all of us, but I'm a policy wonk, and I'm sure there are many in the room. It's a very exciting period to be alive because this is a moment of change which is absolutely fundamental to the future of us all. And it should be an exciting time to be alive for all of you who think about this problem. But it's also worrying because if we make a mess of it, the consequences will be very difficult to extricate ourselves uh, from. Lots of cheerful noises uh, or cheerful observations that we can see. I've already mentioned the collapse in the uh, price of solar PV, and it came as a result of policy. It came as a result of economies of scale, learning by doing, and so on. And this is the uh, price uh, per, per, per megawatt hour, but if you look at the uh, price of a solar PV panel, that's come down by a factor of 10 or so uh, in the year since uh, 2005. It's been quite remarkable. So the kind of things I'm pointing to are not fanciful. We can see the beginnings, and those beginnings came from policy. They come from us encouraging, through feed-in tariffs, other ways, the advance of uh, solar. This is a measure of the uh, co-benefits. I can't go through the whole argument that I've described, but what I'm trying to point to is that the uh, encouragement, the potential that we see in technical progress, there's hard evidence that this can uh, be strong, and the co-benefits which I emphasise, particularly the cutting of air pollution, is very important. Let me give you a very rough uh, idea of how you might do these sums, and let's just take the UK. 29,000 people, call it 30,000 a year, die from air pollution. Take the, uh, the price of a life, it's all very vulgar, but this is what you do when you do looking at road accidents and road improvements and so on, at about uh, two, two million pounds. Two million pounds um, multiplied by 30,000 deaths a year is about 60 billion, which is about uh, ballpark 3% um, of our GDP. Do that for China, you get something like 10% of GDP, not using the same value of a life. The value of life, I'm told, in the United States is six million dollars. Um, I don't, I don't want to go into why you would do that and all the philosophical problems that uh, there are there. And you could ju just run this argument in terms of the deaths and the avoidable deaths rather than actually, that's, that's enough for me, actually, but those of you who like to switch to GDP, and there are lots of, of non-economists who love using GDP, the, uh, you get the magnitudes here. You know, Germany that we think of as being rather a clean place, at least I think of Germany as being rather a clean place, their losses are at 6%, from just from deaths per year from PM 2.5, let alone the lives uh, um, undermined and made much more difficult. Emissions are a very big deal, and it's going to change the whole politics of this as people come to realise just how important this is. Now, um, there's a, there's a, one of the things I enjoyed most about the book was thinking about the moral philosophy and talking to my friends, the moral philosophers, and a, a particularly close friend, John Broom, a White's professor of moral philosophy at Oxford, was I learnt greatly from, but from many others uh, also. Um, economists look at the consequences of actions in look look at look at whether an action is good or bad, or whether a rule is good or bad in terms of its consequences. So if you take the action, some things happen, and you come to try to come to a quantitative judgment usually, not always quantitative, but you try to come to a judgment of whether the consequences of those actions are net good or net bad. And that's the way we go about, that's our trade. And I think it's actually quite sensible to go about things in that way. I, I certainly wouldn't want to ignore the consequences of actions in taking any decisions. But it's deeper than that. No? It's deeper than that. And whichever way you look at it, um, no, from, I, can't, I won't go through the whole thing, but if you just take a, a Kantian view of a categorical imperative where it's wrong to use other people as an instrument of your own interests, well, by goodness, we're using other people, future generations, as an instrument of uh, our own uh, interests. 
You know, if you take an Aristotelian virtue ethics view and ask what uh, good behaviour means, and uh, I surely um, dumping on other people is not, couldn't be counted as uh, virtuous behaviour. Now, you can go into these things and, and do it in much more detail, and uh, I'm obviously riding roughshod over a huge area in moral philosophy. There's a lot in rights and liberties. It seems to me that uh, the, those who uh, uh, come a little bit after us have a right to have their environment uh, not uh, messed up on a big scale by our actions. There are lots of ways in which you can look at the moral philosophy. They all come to the same conclusion that we really ought to, given what we know about the risks of what we're doing, it is immoral to act and just continue as we are. Now, I'm going to flip back to the rest of the lecture, it's the old e economist ways of doing things, but it's very important, particularly for economists, to understand that there are other ways of looking at this, and they point very powerfully in the same way. And if you have a whole bunch, indeed most of the moral, philosoph moral philosophical positions that we use, if they all point powerfully in the same direction, it seems to me it's very, um, well, it, it's ethical to go in that direction. But let me just flip back to the uh, economist's view of things and talk about discounting. Um, uh, anybody who says what is your discount rate should go to the bottom of the class because uh, the way in which we value a unit of output of some good in the future depends fundamentally on what we think the circumstances in the future will be. An extra unit in the future, if, we're gonna be, if we think we're going to be very uh, poor, we would normally attach a high value to. An extra unit in the future, if we think we're going to be very rich, perhaps we'd attach less value to. That's absolutely fundamental observation here because what the future is going to be like depends critically on what we do now. You cannot read off a discount rate uh, just from some place like the market and apply it to this problem because what the future looks like depends fundamentally on what we do now. In the language of the uh, inelegant language of our subject, it's endogenous. So that's uh, the first part of the discounting story. Will we be richer or poorer in the future? Well, it depends what we do now, which means our approach to discounting has to be part of um, our analysis and can't just be um, pulled out from somewhere else and um, uh, bracketed on to this particular problem. The second is what we call pure time discounting, and that's about the discounting of lives. I've already spoken about richer or poorer in the future. Let's put that to one side and let's consider a life in the future which is exactly as rich or poor as our own lives now and ask how we should value um, things that happen to such a life. Well, it seems to me uh, that most of what we do would be to treat that as something like equal footing. If people are in exactly the same circumstances as you, from all relevant uh, economic um, and other levels, why would you attach a lower weight to somebody who has to be born, happens to have been born 20 years after somebody else? We wouldn't do, we wouldn't do it for voting, we wouldn't do it in front of uh, uh, a jury. We would regard people, um, and it's a, it's a basic notion, uh, if you look at um, it, you know, the American Constitution or Tom Paine or, 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 or well, I mean the, the Declaration of Independence or, or Tom Paine, wherever you look, there's the basic equality of um, the human being. And that's what you mean by um, comparing lives. Now the only difference between the lives I'm talking about, because I've assumed they're identical in terms of consumption level, is that one happens to start later than the other. Well, it's very hard to see that as a reason for valuing those two lives in different ways. If you took a pure time discount rate at 2%, which a number of economists quite foolishly have done, you would be saying a life that started 35 years after another one would be worth half as much. An identical life that started 35 years after another one would be worth half as much. It's extremely hard to see any kind of ethical basis for that. Um, I've emphasised it because some people take this strange position. Quite a lot of people. Anyway, there are lots of um, 
intragenerational issues are important. I'll come back to that, but there's a basic fundamental inequity in all this. It's the rich countries that are um, responsible um, for a big part, perhaps half of past emissions, uh, one billion of seven billion people now. Looking back, it's the rich countries who've been responsible for around a half of global emissions since the uh, beginning of the Industrial Revolution. And you would argue, I think, that there is some historical responsibility uh, there. Their emissions are still much higher than those of um, developing uh, countries. So what you've got really is rich countries have a, have a major responsibility for past emissions and poor people are hit earliest and hardest. I'll be coming back to that and, uh, in just a, just a moment. So the um, way... Uh, the way in which many of us have come to look at this, and now I'm getting a bit more, and this is approaching the end of what I have to say, I'm getting a bit more into the language of international agreements. Um, the, the way I find it attractive to approach all this, and again, perhaps we can develop it if, if there are anybody interested in, in questions, is the language of equitable access to sustainable development. That every, in the notion of equality of individuals, there is some kind of equality to make yourself a better and sustainable life. And that's the language actually introduced by uh, Jairam Ramesh, uh, then the uh, Indian Ministry of Environment, into and agreed at the uh, Conference of the Parties, number 16, in Cancun in 2010. It's actually quite different from, but includes, the notion of common but differentiated responsibility, which was the very early language in uh, the original agreements uh, in 1992, which set up the UNFCCC, where it was seen that, uh, that this whole story of change was a burden and other people, the rich countries, uh, would have to cover the poor countries for the cost of this adjustment and burden. So it's actually rather a divisive concept, common but differentiated responsibility, which is a kind of burden, um, not necessarily a bad word, but it's a, it's a, it's a word that can um, pull people apart, whereas equitable access to sustainable development is a whole uh, much more positive idea of making something good happen and bringing uh, everybody to have a chance to participate in this something good that happens. Language matters because uh, you don't have to be Wittgensteinian to realise that the concept it embodies really does make a difference. But it also resonates politically in different ways. So psychology and politics, I'm going to be fast here and I'm going to say both from the psychological point of view and from the politics point of view, all this is very difficult. But then I'm going to be uh, my usual shining optimistic personality will come through and I'll say actually we can, we can, we can handle this stuff. But you, you don't handle it unless you recognise the difficulties. So, no, but I have to say that on the psychological side, just as I went to the White's Professor of Moral Philosophy, John Broom, to uh, try to get um, uh, strengthen uh, my philosophical education, I went to Danny Kahneman to talk about uh, um, uh, the psychology. Now, I won't go to, into it in any detail, but people's assessment of probabilities and risks are terrible. And they, affect, they are affected enormously by the frequency of mention of a subject, and it's why the media are so important in uh, all this. Um, if you ask people, are they likely to uh, be shot or run over um, with a higher probability than dying of diabetes, they'd tell you that they're more likely to be shot or run over because they see that all the time in the newspapers. They don't see, but of course, probably the dying of diabetes orders of magnitude bigger than this story. Uh, much more likely to die from air pollution than uh, either of those uh, things. So the way in which we speak is very important. Um, Danny e emphasises, and I, I take it very seriously, the importance of trusted messengers. I'm not sure that economists are trusted messengers, <laughs> but I think, I think the Pope is a trusted messenger, at least this one. And... Um, <laughs> We're going to hear very soon, um, sometime in the next few weeks, an encyclical on this issue. That will matter enormously. And that's, uh, he, last year he, he said in May that uh, if we destroy creation, well, creation will destroy us. Now, I, I'm going to take creation rather liberally in terms of, um, you know, what, what we have in terms of flora and fauna in a, 
in a wonderful world, and if we pull that apart, we will pay the price in terms of a very hostile environment. And uh, I, I, I can uh, say that in September, I'm gonna go and talk to him. Um, I didn't say I'm coming, <laughs> he, he, he invited, but the... Um, <laughs> But I think it, that, that kind of thing is extremely important. People get diverted very easily. We were very badly diverted by the uh, recession. That should have been the moment with unemployment, interest rates on the floor. That should have been the moment to invest in the economic growth story of the future. But there are, it, those, those things are difficult to, if you ask people about the dangers of climate change in a hot room, they're much more likely to say it's very worrying than if you ask them about the dangers of climate change in a cold room. I mean, it, it is remarkable how people are influenced, and yet just ha you have to recognise that. Um, Danny Kahneman has, has said that you know the status quo bias and loss aversion is very important. So people are cautious about change. There are all kinds of things. He's a he's a wonderful read, and I'm sure lots of you uh, have read him. But it does mean that communication on risk, communication about change, is hard. Um, politics also the. Uh, uh, there are very short-term cycles, as uh, we know. Vested interests can be very powerful in opposing, uh, imposing change. So there are all sorts of reasons in politics and in uh, psychology why this is hard. But let me move to a more positive story. The, um, if we recognise that so much of what we do is extremely attractive, less congested, less polluted, less efficient cities, fundamental importance in this whole story. Why wouldn't you want more efficient, you know, less polluted, less congested cities? Enormously attractive. This is a big growth and attractive growth story. That's what um, we set out. I, you, know, you can't read all this, but it's a summary of the Better Growth, Better Climate report that, uh, from the Global Commission on Economy and the Environment, which uh, chaired by uh, Felipe Calderon, former president of Mexico, I co-chaired that, we reported in September 2014. And we showed in some detail how this whole story of structural transformation I've described, how this story of a much better, um, of much better way to run our cities and so on could uh, lead to um, um, better growth and better climate. I mean, the title was carefully uh, chosen there. And I should underline that all this in the fastest technical progress the uh, world has ever seen. We've got digital, materials, biotechnology, all going on at the same time. And I was at a Google gathering not so long ago where they were telling us very strongly that all of this is in the very early stages. And I believe it. So, so true, for, same is true for materials and biotechnology. We're in the very early stages of fundamental technological revolution revolutions which are going to make this all um, possible if we just put our minds to it and accelerate those processes and implement what, uh, what we find. So overall then, um, there are big problems in politics, but you can cheer yourself up by thinking that notwithstanding the problems of free riding on these uh, public goods, notwithstanding the problems of short-termism, a lot of people are starting to do things. The great Jerry Brown in California declared the same emissions reductions policies, um, reducing um, by 40% 1990 to 2030, as we did in the European Union. He, in, a, in the face of a big swing to the Republicans, Jerry got 60% of the votes in California. Now, California, California is not America, and America is not the world. You know, but California is a very big economy, would be number seven in the world, I think, if it was a separate... Uh, state, um, that China has changed remarkably in the last few years. Coal peaked in China probably last year. Now it may be a flat peak, it may look more like a plateau, but you've got an economy growing at 7% that everybody says that uh, they're piling on the coal and it keeps on coming. It's not. It stopped in China, stopped rising anyway, and uh, we have to see how soon it will fall, but uh, that's not uh, so far away. It certainly fell 2014 relative to 2013. It will probably fall again this year. And it will be a big part of the 13th five-year plan, which is being completed now, which I've been involved in to some extent in, in China. It will be uh, revealed at the end of this year that uh, that will involve radical change. Now, I've only given a few examples, but they're big ones. 
and it's important to see uh, how you can get change notwithstanding the obstacles that I uh, described. Countries like Bangladesh and Ethiopia have set themselves, very poor countries, have set themselves very clear targets which involve low carbon. They could say, well, look, you know, our emissions are tiny, uh, let us grow as we wish, not put this problem to one side. No, they've said we have a real responsibility here, not only to think of all the nasty things that are likely to happen as a result of climate change and adapt and protect, that's vital, but also that we have a responsibility to keep down uh, our emissions. So it is, notwithstanding all the difficulties that I underlined, and deliberately so, it's actually quite a cheering view of um, ourselves as, as a world that uh, there's lots of positive signs. But, and it's a uh, big but, is that, uh, that um, we're moving far too slowly. So how do we, and I'll just give in, in, what I, in, what I, in closing a measure of that. But there are lots of things we can do. Um, the AP4, the Swedish Pension Fund, has this idea of decarbonising the portfolio. They're very big, so they have a lot of, say, car firms. They look at all the car firms. They work out who's the least responsible. They sell that share and they say, why? And they've done very well, yeah? Decarbonising the uh, portfolio. You can do the same with airlines. It's not just the uh, hydrocarbon companies. Sell the airline that's the most irresponsible. And you can, that, you can, you can work that out. And you should encourage that to be worked out. You should encourage reporting that allows you to do that. You can put quite a lot of pressure in uh, that way of a very uh, good kind. There's all kind of leadership from cities, whether it's New York City or uh, Bogota, and I think you're increasingly getting uh, religious leadership. Campaigns like the, you don't have to read The Guardian to work out that you should be keeping it in the ground, although if you do read The Guardian you couldn't have escaped the importance of uh, keeping it in the ground, but I already argued why that was uh, essentially uh, necessary. I think our young people, um, you know, it's very hard to see what young people now should get excited about politically. Um, it's a pretty depressing picture um, in terms of the, what the political parties have to offer, not just here but also elsewhere. But uh, they are, I think, building and pushing strongly, and rightly so, because it's uh, their future on this issue. So there are all sorts of ways in which that pressure can... Uh, so let me close on Paris. I said lots of people moving in good directions. It's not fast enough. We've run the numbers. Rodney Boyd, uh, Rodney Boyd and Bob Ward and myself. It looks as if the, um, uh, the promises for Paris, call them what you will, internationally intended nationally determined contributions, uh, will come in about 55 uh, or above, between 55 and 60 for uh, 2030. Uh, on any reasonable calculation, we shouldn't be above 40. So we're going to come in much too high. So the big test for Paris is honesty about that gap. It must be recognised. And processes for strong acceleration after Paris. So look in Paris, not just at the promises, look for the honesty that they're too high and for the means to accelerate. That will be a very important... That will be the first test by which any of us should be... Uh, judging Paris. We will get an agreement in Paris. It's what in the, what's in the agreement that really counts. And I think we've got a good chance of getting a process of acceleration into that agreement, but it's far from uh, settled. So, let me end uh, on the story of opportunity and optimism, but worry that we miss it. The risks are immense. The opportunities to create a much more attractive world in the next two or three decades are absolutely with us with the structural transformation and the rapid technical progress. Um, I'm profoundly optimistic about what we can do. I don't know what we will do, but I think discussing what we can do and showing how attractive it is and showing the risks of what happens if we don't do it is fundamental to creating the political will, and it's the political will that counts. And if we can put that together, we will rise to what in my view, and I'm not alone in this, we will be able to rise to the two defining challenges of this century, overcoming poverty and managing climate change. And if we fail on one, we fail on the other. Thank you.
questions sitting down. Yeah. Nick, thank you very, very much for your speech. We're going to open the floor to questions now from the audience, and I want to ask the audience, when you speak, let us know your name and affiliation. I think the answers are primarily the organizations you work for are not political parties. Um, and wait for the stewards with the roving microphone to get to you. Let's call the gentleman over here towards the wall. We'll next go to the other side down in the front. It appears likely that whatever is agreed at Paris, the United States Congress won't ratify or approve such a deal. And I wonder to what extent uh, that's predictable and to what extent that will deter other nations from sticking to their intended actions. <coughs> Studies Institute. I, Professor Stern, I would very much like to share your optimism, uh, particularly as it was couched in terms of profound optimism in the end of your talk just now. But it seems to me that there are no grounds whatsoever for optimism about the future. And I think one of the dangers that stems from well, one of the main causes of this is this reference to carbon reduction or the reduction of carbon emissions when it is not a reduction of carbon emissions from the essential global perspective that we must take. It is a reduction in the increase, in the extent of increase in global emissions. You rightly referred in your, uh, at the beginning of your talk to the fact that uh, uh, greenhouse gases are accumulating in the atmosphere and therefore to talk about the degree of reduction that we can achieve in 20, 30, 40 years implies that it is a reduction from the present level in concentrations, which is far from true. So I would just finish on this particular question. My grounds for pessimism, deep pessimism, are the following. Unless you are able to indicate how it is realistically possible to reverse the process, which is, for instance, melting the Arctic ice caps, unless you can say this is the way that we could do it and do it quickly and at cost, um, then things can only get worse. So thank you. you, thank you. I think assure me on that? Coming okay, do you one want more? to go ahead and ask hey, one, more? one more? Okay, let's go one more right in the center, man in a blue shirt. Hey, old man, huh? And, uh, yeah, well, you're right. We've got to counter that. Hi, uh, Joseph Paul. Uh, um, so you talk about how preventing climate change can also be attractive. Um, solar is a good example. You're converting something free into energy. Um, but some parts are obviously going to be very unattractive. Um, one that comes to mind is probably the single biggest lever that we as individuals can pull, which is diet change. Um, how, how in your book and how right now do you suggest we approach the most unattractive levers. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Um, there won't be a, uh, an agreement in Paris that requires ratification by Congress. It will be designed so it doesn't require ratification by Congress. Uh, everybody involved is uh, deeply aware of uh, that that's a no-go area. And um, there's a lot of legal advice. Um, through Todd Stern and others, who said, brackets, no relation, who <laughs> we refer to each other as Cousin Nick and Cousin Todd, just to confuse people, but there's, um, there's no relation. The whole structure is going to be designed so that uh, it can be done without ratification by Congress. And there are ways that that can uh, be done by looking at uh, this as a... Uh, uh, an, an adjustment to the details of the UNFCCC agreement, which was ratified. So there, there are roomfuls of lawyers working in Washington on how that can be done, and I think it's pretty clear that it can be done. So we, we just won't go there. Um, but it, the fact that we can't go there will influence the kind of ways in which uh, this would be designed and presented. Mara, I was very clear that I was optimistic about what can be done. I drew a very sharp distinction between what can be done and what will be done. 
And I, I will draw that distinction again. And I think we can describe how emissions can be reduced uh, sufficiently quickly to keep concentrations over time in uh, a region which uh, allow us at least a 50-50 chance of two degrees. And the graphs which I uh, illustrated with the brown and the green and the blue paths were um, graphs of, um, uh, that come from the science which allow you to control the overall volume of emissions added up over time in a way that would allow you a 50-50 chance of two degrees. And then you go from there to describe what you can do with our economies that would allow you to follow such a path. That's but why... Can you reverse the principle? No, no, no I'm, I, you, you're not understanding what I'm just... Listen for a moment. The, what we're talking about is the integral over a period of time of all the emissions that allow us as uh, a world to hold to two degrees centigrade with a 50-50 chance. That was the path that I followed. At some point, in my view, since it's likely we're going to have to go close to zero by the end of the century, we're going to have to have a range of negative emissions activities as a flow. And we can see those too. Essentially, they are reforestation and regrading of degraded forests. There's carbon capture in, uh, in, uh, in the soil. There's carbon capture and storage for biomass. And there are the various methods of extracting CO2 from the air, uh, which the wonderful Klaus Slackner and uh, Leonard Kostler and others are working on. <coughs> I, put, I put that forth deliberately. But I think the first three are actually rather serious possibilities, and we're likely to, uh, to need to use them. And I think it's very important that, um, that we pursue those and pursue those strongly. The last ones are um, uh, come close to being miraculous. And there's a wonderful um, uh, climate eco economist called Otmar Edenhofer, who trained as a Jesuit and uh, is, uh, is a very good religious person. And he said, Nick, um, I, I'm a Catholic and I believe in miracles, but as a policy wonk, I wouldn't want to rely on them. And um, I think that uh, that last one is, uh, is uh, a bit of a long shot, but we've got to take the long shots and we've got to look at them. So I think that uh, the negative story is something that you should look at, look at very carefully, but I don't think of that as sort of the geoengineering of firing muck into the atmosphere and that's not where I would go. Okay, let's go. Diet change. There was diet, diet change. Oh, um, you didn't answer diet change, yeah. right. Um, <laughs> a, a North American meat diet um, is probably three or four tons per capita, um, particularly if it's sourced through soya that uh, comes from cutting down forests. And I said that uh, we could be total two tons per capita, um, have, would need to be total two tons per capita in 2050. So uh, um, meat is important. You know, coal is probably 30% of emissions, and meat is probably 15%. But um, you know, chicken is much better than uh, beef, um, and uh, there are lots of uh, lots of options. Um, meat that comes through soya is different from meat that comes in other ways. Um, that no, maybe the sheep roaming around in Scotland are much less, putting much less pressure on the planet than uh, um, industrialised uh, beef fed from soya. So there are margins here that uh, we need to look at, but it's big, and it's very important that it's discussed uh, explicitly. Okay, I'm trying to change gender balance, and I need women in the audience to help me by holding up their hands. There's one on the row two and one on the aisle in the middle here. Thank you. I try to be to to be very brief. Um, <coughs> I just came here from an investors uh, meeting from ICGN. So international investors are from around the world are in London these days, uh, <coughs> just to discuss engagement on also climate change. Uh, so there is a big commitment from investors, um, and uh, uh, you know to to engage exactly on palm oil, on beef, uh, on on soy, as you were saying. So thank you very much for, for the hope you're giving to the new generation.
questions. I just wanted to, I don't have a, a question, specific question, but I have a suggestion. There is a website here in England which was created by University of, of Oxford students, which is www.pushyourparents.org, and there there is a campaign which is committing students to, uh, to, uh, to support that. And also, uh, being Italian, uh, I mean, we replicated that, and we are also engaging there to create a welcome from Pro Francis uh, Encyclica. Thank you. Thank you. I'll hand the center. And the next one will be in the very last row in the back. Though, so. Isabella Newegg from ICF International. Taking the EU as an example, if we look from at emissions um, overall from 1995 to, well, let's take 2012, we can see that overall they're fairly stable and actually um, there's been quite a lot of um, investment in, into energy efficiency already. Carbon intensity is you know, decreasing and obviously that's not enough. Like you said, um, technological progress can happen and it's already happening, but it's not at the rate fast enough. So I wonder um, if you had to pick a few key policies that have played a role in driving this change and um, and the ones that have had the biggest impact and the ones that we need to improve upon the most. And obviously the emissions trading system is one, but what are some of the key other ones that we need to work on? Okay. Thank you. Then up to the very last row. Here. <coughs> Hiya. Um, I was just wondering, you mentioned that the role of the media was incredibly important in getting people to engage with the issue and make changes and move forward and get people behind it. Do you think a lot of the media focus on the doom and gloom of climate change as opposed to foc focusing on uh, economic viable solutions sort of adds to an air of defeatism where people go, oh well, you know what, we're, up, we're already screwed. Why bother doing anything about it? Um, if I wrote down correctly, www.pushyourparents.org. So go there. Um, <laughs> the, um, the EU, I think uh, energy efficiency is a very big deal. It's probably at least 40%, perhaps 50% of what we have to do. Uh, standards there can be terribly important. Um, emissions, you know, the, the petrol consumption and carbon emissions of cars are far lower now than they were 10 years ago, and that's uh, almost entirely as a result of uh, regulation and standards. It can be very powerful uh, on domestic appliances and, and uh, so on. I was just talking to Montex Singh Alawalia today about uh, how powerful standards could be in, uh, in India. It, they, could be, these, they could have a very big effect. We've made a big mess of carbon pricing in Europe and the emissions trading scheme. You don't have to be a professor of economics at the LSE to work out that if you give away too many permits, um, the price will crash and they, uh, the recession came along and they, did, they did, didn't adjust the number of per permits. Uh, on top of permits which originally were too high and the price crashed. Well, that's fairly easy to sort out and they should. Um, so energy efficient standards, strong, uh, a lot through regulation, uh, strong carbon prices, um, uh, strong investment in innovation. I gave the example of the uh, Apollo program and stop coal. The, the media. Uh, you have to be aware of the risks, but um, I spend more and more of my time trying to run through the risks quickly, but they're very big and, and you have to focus, but I try and spend more of my, certainly more of my, my own research time on the alternative um, parts in particular. What I mean by that is the transition to the low carbon economy, and the more you look at it, the more attractive uh, it becomes. So I think it's extremely important to do that. I mean, if you ask, do you want, um, I'll, I'll repeat it, but it's very important, do you want um, 
less polluting, less congested, more efficient uh, cities. Well, who's going to vote no to that? Um, at least what majority is going to vote no to that? As we talk about, and I have discussed it directly with George Osborne, if we talk about the cities of the north and investing in different ways and investing in change, there's an enormous opportunity to go strongly in, uh, in that direction. So I think um, reporting on the cheerful things, which are not only cheerful, they're also fundamentally necessary, would be much better. And David Attenborough, at our launch of the Apollo program on um, Monday, said how wonderful it was to move on from you know, stop this, stop that, it's all terribly dangerous, to things we can do. And uh, that's why I think examples like the Apollo program are really very valuable, because they're exciting things we can do. Very modest investments in uh, uh, solar and uh, storage could be transformational. OK, while you're up there, take the gentleman, just one row in front, and then we'll move into the center area here. Woman. Uh, James Page, um, do you think we should build another runway? Okay, good question. There's a woman right here. Hold up your hand so she can see you with the microphone. Yeah. Hello, uh, Bibba Hartigan from Climate, a uh, social network for people who want to take practical action on the causes and effects of climate change. I'd be interested to know what you see as the role for the individual in all of this. Um, None of, uh, while we all hope for agreement in Paris, none of us really expect the targets to go far enough. And um, what is actually going to push us to the levels we really need to achieve the 2%, the two degrees um, aim? Is this where the individual and the grassroots come in? Thank you. And over here, um, the gentleman in the green jacket in the third row. Thank you for such a good talk. The Science Museum has just recently been caught betraying true for money for a sponsorship from oil companies. And this building as well has been very contributed to from oil companies. Do you think these oil companies that are buying our institutions are distorting <coughs> the knowledge and truth on this subject we're talking about tonight? Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, another runway. Um, the way of uh, tackling emissions from airlines um, has to come uh, uh, in, in three ways, really. One is the demand side, and it's very important that uh, uh, pollution should be properly priced because that would influence demand. Coming through um, innovation in the uh, supply side, which means um, much uh, cleaner, lighter aeroplanes organizing their uh, operation in much more efficient ways, and there are lots of uh, margins there, and basically finding something to put into them uh, which doesn't emit uh, carbon dioxide, or at least is uh, through its lifetime, is uh, zero emissions. So um, it seems to me that the most important use for um, biofuels, um, uh, for artificial photosynthesis, algae and so on, would be in uh, airlines. I think we could have all our surface transport uh, electric from zero carbon uh, electricity. And then we'd, because of if you're going to fly, you've got to have something that has a power to weight ratio like kerosene. And that I think you're going to have to do through biofuels or artificially. So those are the three margins, I think, uh, for policy. Uh, and if you, do fly, if you do fly, you should offset. So I think those are the kinds of things that uh, I would go for. And it would be an answer in terms of overall policy rather than a specific runway here or uh, a specific runway there. Um, it's going to be, you know, it's probably about 3% of emissions and it could rise uh, quite quickly around the world. The big expansions are going to be in China and uh, India. So I think it's important to find ways on a global scale of managing, and I think those are the dimensions that I described. I think climate change, um, Howard Davis will be publishing his results um, in the next couple of uh, weeks on that one, so watch this space. The um, 
climate change and the role for the individual. I think public discussion, discussions in communities about what responsibility means is extremely important. If you think about uh, smoking, drunken driving, HIV AIDS, um, awareness through public discussion, awareness through putting the evidence on the table, awareness through asking what you can do was very important. And you do get communities, and we, we have a greening hearting uh, group very close to where we live in West Sussex who talk and think about ways of doing things, how you can work together to recycle, how you can uh, share transport. And um, they're on the whole, it seems to me, things that make uh, communities rather attractive. And it, oh, oh, so much of this is that you can't reuse and recycle other than in communities. You can't have public transport other than in communities. You can't have combined heat and power other than in communities. So the way in which communities function is extremely important. And the collective action reinforces the individual action. But there's also the notion of responsibility. If you look at Mothers Against Drunken Driving, uh, it was getting the evidence on the table, table, drawing people's attention to just how horrible that was. And people stopped, uh, I mean, in my generation did drive drunk, this generation much less so, and it's because there's been a changing view of responsibility. It's not just because your license gets taken away, that's the tax or the carrot that we economists talk about. It's also because people, by talking to each other and looking at the evidence, uh, encouraging each other, change the view of what responsible means. And I think that is a very important part of this uh, story. Sponsorship from uh, oil companies. Um, my view is a bit like AP4 and the um, looking at how you decarbonize portfolios. Um, you probably ride on diesel buses. Uh, I dare say that you fly. Um, you demand, you demand hydrocarbons. And what we're trying to build is a world that uses much less hydrocarbons. So those are the kinds of policies that we should be thinking about. And like AP4, where you look at you know, car firms, airlines, and so on, some oil companies behave worse than others. And putting pressure on that seems to me to be the right thing to do. And we can see how to bring that pressure to bear. There are some oil companies, I won't name them, who fund cli sci climate science deniers. I think uh, a decent institution would not want to be associated with such oil companies. Five European oil companies wrote to Laurent Fabius on Monday, uh, BP and Shell and Eni and uh, Statoil and Total, asking for a strong price on carbon and asking for that as an outcome of Paris. Now, you can speculate about their motives, but that is a group, all European oil companies, as it happens, that are looking for more responsible behavior. But while you use buses driven by diesel, whilst you fly, you've got to recognize that your demand is calling forth a supply. Our challenge is to adjust demand and to uh, adjust supply through the kind of policies that I described. And if you, if you educate at London School of Economics, you worry about incentives and you try to design those in a way that the incentive structures work well. And I tried to give examples, again, AP4 is one of those, but there are others too, who I think manage that quite well. Okay, I'm gonna take just two last questions, I'm afraid we're getting there. Um, so let's go to the gentleman in the blue shirt and the gray jacket in about the fifth row, if we can. And then we'll go up to the back. There's a man uh, with a blue shirt tie. Yeah. Uh, I'm David Wood from London Futurists. I want to come back to the very impressive Apollo program that you described. And I wonder what can be done to get some more of the big oil companies on board with that program rather than fighting it from the outside. What can be done to change the incentives and the operating parameters of these companies so that they would stop seeing themselves as big oil and start seeing themselves as part of big energy, part of jumping into this wonderful new sixth wave of innovation that you described. I mean, after all, these companies have incredible resources and huge talents and uh, uh, lots of uh, things that could be done, and if only they saw themselves differently, constrained perhaps by different uh, legislation or 
whatever, then they would be allies in this uh, grand uh, challenge rather than uh, stick in the mud, dragging everything down. Okay, a man in a blazer and a tie there, or a dark suit and tie. That's over there. That's it. Yeah. Hi, good evening. I'm a former LSE student and a former analyst at the New Climate Economy Project. My question <laughs> is about geoengineering. Where do you stand on ge geoengineering? Do you think it's an ethical solution going forward? Yeah. Uh, on, thank you very much. Uh, on, on bringing oil companies into that whole research story, all, all I can say is yes, and uh, we can think of uh, ways of doing that. Uh, we were pointing particularly to public funded research but if you look uh, around the world, often publicly funded research and privately funded research is roughly one to two, and one triggers the other. So you would want to design the, the Apollo program, which is largely public money that we're talking about, in a way that crowds in as much as possible of um, private money. And I think the average target is two to one. Uh, you know, one dollar of public research money goes with two dollars of private. I'd hope we could design it in a way that that multiplier was still bigger. And I think you're right. I'd look particularly to the energy companies, which means mostly hydrocarbon companies, to, uh, to do that. Uh, we're very proud of our uh, uh, alumni, so I hope you uh, keep on coming. And uh, thank you for the work on the new climate economy. I, in response to Maya's question, I tried to describe what I thought were good ways of going negative on uh, emissions. Uh, forests, carbon in the soil, biofuels with carbon capture and storage, and some of the more imaginative ways of trying to pull um, CO2 out of the air and using it to, to make buildings and, uh, and build roads and, and, and so on. Those are the ways that I would look. Um, I don't find geoengineering terribly helpful language. What I described is four good ways with different prospects, different potential scales, all should be investigated, of um, going to uh, negative emissions in important areas of the economy. If by geoengineering you mean uh, firing up uh, dust into the atmosphere, um, I, I would be very wary of that, and I go along with the Royal Society's study of that, which said that um, it looks very risky, uh, including lots of things that might happen that we don't really understand and some things that we probably don't know about. So I'd be very wary of, of that kind of thing. But the, uh, I, I don't think we should take it off the research agenda. Uh, this problem is sufficiently s severe that we have to try to understand everything that we can. But if you've got four rather promising ways of uh, proceeding towards zero emissions, I would put more of my research activity on those. Okay, Nick, thank you very much for a wonderful event. I really appreciate it, and I think the audience really appreciates it. Too. Thank you.